Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. So glad that you're here in both of our rooms, especially if you're new. However it is that you're here, whether you're brand new around here or whether you've been here a long time, we're just really glad. So last week we started this new series that we're calling ReSync because our souls in the busyness of life get out of sync with our Heavenly Father. And there's just time seasons that we just need to pull off and say, wait a second, I got to remember who I am and whose I am. We got to get our souls reconnected to heaven. And that's what we're working on this week. So Dan got us kicked off last week with a great message on uh, God's word and coming back to the truth of God's word in our life. And I was so fired up. I think it was nearly 900 of you filled out the little cards and said, I'm going to step into the challenge of resyncing this month. And we've been praying for you. And, and I've been so heartened by the notes and the texts that you've been sending back. And that is awesome. If you didn't step in, but you're wanting to step in today, why don't you just step in today as we continue? So we're going to go to Luke in the New Testament, chapter 11. So turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. If you didn't bring a Bible and you would like to hold one in your hand and follow along, why don't you wave at one of the ushers right now that are coming in the aisles and they'll be glad to let you borrow one and you can keep it if you need one because you don't have one. So we'll go to Luke um, chapter 11 um, in just a moment. What we're going to be talking about today is prayer. And I've noticed something. Whenever uh, we talk about prayer, it's easy to talk about with people who are seeing direct answers to what they've been praying. You talk to that person about prayer, they're like, oh, I just love how prayer works. And that, it's easy, right? When, you, when uh, maybe you've been longing to, to get this certain job and you've been praying and they call and they offer you an interview and wow, God's answering my prayer. Or maybe uh, you've been praying for a fragile marriage. And what do you know? It seem, things seem to be get, getting better. Um, or, or maybe you've been praying for somebody's um, health situation or other life situations, and they seem to be improving. You're like, wow, thank you, God. This prayer thing is marvelous. But I also notice that it's not nearly as easy to talk about prayer with somebody, particularly when the answer isn't seeming to come. Like <clears throat> when you've been praying for your loved one, Maybe your spouse who's drinking too much. God, would you please, please, please break in on his life or her life and yet they come home again and nothing's different. Or maybe you've been praying for uh, that marriage and you're just praying, God, would you intervene? Would you heal? Would you rest? And it doesn't seem to be happening. Maybe you've been praying for a job for yourself or for another loved one and the interviews aren't coming. Or maybe you've been praying for a sale and nothing is moving. And you're just saying, God, what is going on here? Uh, You know, is this prayer thing doing any good? Are my prayers getting past the ceiling? Are they just getting stopped right there? Do you even care up there what's going on? You ever had any of those feelings about prayer? I bet you have. Sure you have. All of us have had those sorts of feelings from time to time. And the good news is that Jesus knew this would be our experience. And so he even spoke to this experience in the parable that we're going to look at today. So uh, let's go to Luke chapter 11. Now let me just give you one more bit of background before we read it. So in Luke chapter 11, right at the very start, the disciples have been watching Jesus. They've been saying, you know, we noticed something. We noticed you pray differently than who? Than everybody. You just pray so differently. And we want you to teach us how to pray. And at this point, he moves into what we call the Lord's Prayer, or if you come from Catholic background, the Our Father and um, which is a very good model or outline for prayer. We've looked at that a couple of times here in the last couple of years. Just a method or an outline for 
praying. Not going to do that today because you can go back to early January, about January 15th, I think it was last year, if you would like to pick up that one um, where I sat in the rocking chair and we kind of went through that model of prayer. But after he gives them the how, he says, but I want to talk to you about something else. I want to talk to you about how it feels many times when we're praying. That's important for us to get as well. How does it feel sometimes when we're praying? All right. And so with that background, let's see what he says uh, when we come into this parable he tells in uh, chapter 11, verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer. In other words, suppose you get a surprise guest in the middle of the night and in that culture, hospitality is everything. So, of course, you're like, well, come on in. Oh, my gosh. I wasn't expecting this. And you haven't got any food to offer, so that's not very hospitable. You're like, come on in. Make yourself at home here. Hang on. I just need to run outside for a moment. You run outside, and you run next door. And you're knocking on the neighbor's door in the middle of the night, and you're saying, hey, I just had a guest who came over in the middle of the night, and I hadn't gotten any food to feed him. And that's unthinkable. Get up and give me some bread. Give me some three loaves of bread because I, I got to have something to serve. <clears throat> and verse 7, suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. In the Middle East in those days and sometimes in these days, houses were so small, homes were so small that they were just one room, a one room house. So it's all in there together. Uh, and so when it was nighttime, when it was bedtime, the family would roll the mattress out and they would all climb in together because it's not like you go to the other room and watch the end of the Astros game or sports center. I mean, it's like we're all in here together. So it's bedtime. So the man, he's getting his door knocked on and the, the, the neighbor's saying, give me, get up and give me some food. He's like, get out of here. I already put the family to bed. We're all in bed. And what's the guy do? I just heard you in there. I'm not leaving. I'm telling you, I got a guest. I got to have some food. Get up and give me some bread, he's saying. It just keeps on knocking. I know that you have what I need inside there. So what happens? Verse 8 tells us, Jesus saying, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he'll surely get up and he'll give you as much as you need. Shameless audacity. That can also be translated perseverance or persistence. Because of your persistence, um, he's going to get up. So the disciples are hearing this story, and they're trying to understand because Jesus would always tell these, these made-up stories called parables. And sometimes they're like, okay, okay, the subject is prayer. We asked them, teach us how to pray. And now he just told us this weird story about these neighbors knocking on the doors and everything. Let's get the character straight first, all right? <clears throat> so in this story, the disciples are scratching their heads. They're like, okay, we people... There's always God in the story, and there's always us in the story. So we must be represented by the guy who goes next door, and he starts knocking, because that sounds kind of like prayer, right? And so he's knocking on the That's us. And then God in this story must be like the grouchy neighbor who is in bed asleep and doesn't want to get up. Is that right, Jesus? And Jesus is like, yep, you got the characters right. So wait a second, Jesus, are you saying that our job in prayer is to badger God down, to wear him down until he finally opens the door and gives us what we're asking for because God is probably asleep and he doesn't want to get up and he doesn't want to help us, and, but maybe we can just wear him down and badger him long enough? No. Jesus is going to make clear in verses 11 through 13. You're pushing the parable too far. At this point, this is what's called a parable of contrast. He's telling us if that um, tired, crotchety neighbor finally is willing to get up and meet the needs of his knocking neighbor, then you need to realize how much more 
will your heavenly Father, who actually loves you, eagerly get up and meet the needs of his own children? Imagine this. So the contrast here is that our God in heaven is not like a grouchy neighbor. He's a loving father. And you're not a nuisance neighbor. You're a precious child of his. But at times, particularly when the answer isn't coming the way that we'd wanted, not as fast as we had wanted, prayer, Jesus was saying, may feel a lot like this story where you're just having to keep coming back. Sometimes prayer is going to feel that way, Jesus said. So what do we do? Verse 9. So I say, Jesus says, keep on asking. It'll be given to you. Keep on seeking. And you will find. Keep on knocking. And the door will get opened to you. Now, at this point, you can imagine the, the disciples are sort of scratching their heads. They're like, whoa, this is like so different, Jesus, than anything we were ever taught in Hebrew school growing up. I mean, what you're describing is this, this very real, earthy, genuine, authentic dialogue that, that we're having with, with God. And, and when we were being brought up in Hebrew school, we were just taught sort of things that you said by memory, and, and, but you're not like really wrestling with God about it. You just, sort of, you just sort of memorize it, and you just sort of say it. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's the problem. That's not really prayer. That's just recitation because prayer is real. It's earthy. It's gritty. It's authentic. It's genuine. There's a relationship here. There's a dialogue that's going on here where someone is saying, God, if you don't, it won't. You got to do something. There's no other way. And so I'm not leaving I'm staying, God, and I'm going to keep asking, and I'm going to keep seeking, and I'm going to keep knocking, because if you won't, it won't, and I'm not leaving. And don't you know in the heart of God, when he hears somebody praying like that, he's finally like, oh, finally, one of my precious children is understanding who I am and coming to me with, with earnest realness with authenticity, not just coming and reciting some formulaic little mindless thing that his mind isn't even engaged in while he's saying the words. He's not doing that. He's coming in a real, authentic way. Not that he's just coming with sort of the superficial things. Would you help Judy with her head cold or help me to find my car keys? Not that he's against, you know, helping people with their keys or their snot. It's just that God is saying, hey, you know, I'm bigger than that. What if you came at a deeper level and we, and we went after something really more seriously together? God, if you won't, it's not going to happen. Now you do that. Jesus is making clear to us, sometimes it may feel like you're the neighbor knocking. Because sometimes it's going to take a few days. Sometimes it's going to take a few weeks. Sometimes it's going to take a few months or a few years or a few decades. Some of you say, yeah, I know that. I'm in that right now. In this past week, I was having lunch with a friend who has been praying for his son to come to know Jesus. He says, I, I'm just, we're just keeping coming back and asking Asking, asking. But now, let's talk about this. Whenever you talk about this thing of prayer, um, the, inevitably the question arises, um, well, why does the answer take so long, so many times? What, what's going on about that? Well, I think there's three things that we need to talk about. Conditions, let's call them conditions for answered prayer that we get in God's word. And so we need to sort of pull off to the side of the road and talk about these three conditions, okay, to make sure that we understand this clearly. The first one is this. Are you right with God? Are you living in God's will? 
We know from 1 John 5, 14, if you're not living in God's will and praying in God's will, you might save your breath. It's not going to happen. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, am I in God's will? Am I living in God's will? You got to know that when God says something is wrong, it's wrong. And if you persist in living outside of God's will, uh, you can just keep praying and praying and praying. And, but don't you know that the, a, a loving father is going to say, wait a second, why, why would I get, let you move on? Because you still haven't dealt with what I've been talking to you about right here. You've got to deal with this. I remember learning about this in a very personal way firsthand. When I was in seminary, I was 23 years old. And I was learning how to be a preacher. And one of my courses was called a supervised ministry, where I was assigned to an elderly pastor. And on Mondays for four hours, every Monday, I would shadow him. And we would just go around, and he was teaching me how to make pastoral visits. And we'd go from home to home, meeting people in the church and in the hospitals, and we'd visit with people and teaching me how to have conversations sort of just off the cuff with people and, and praying, you know, and so... And uh, I would always be his driver, and his name was Dr. Bagby, Stedman Bagby, and he would sit over in the passenger seat, and he would, just, he would just talk, and I would learn so many things as I listened to him. And he said, now, today, Ken, the next place we're going to go, I need you to turn left here and go down this road, yeah, yeah, now a few more miles and turn right. And we found ourselves driving down this beautiful, long road into one of those um, picturesque Kentucky horse farms on the outskirts of Lexington, Kentucky. And the white picket fence and the horses are out there. And, and there's the mansion. It was painted. I mean, it looked like a movie. I was like, my gosh. Now, tell me about who we're going to see here. He says, well, Ken, we're going to go see an old friend of mine. His name, name is Ralph. And Ralph is having an affair with a younger woman. And he just needs someone to come and to speak the truth in love to him. And so we're going to go and do that now. And I remember gulping and saying, all right then. And so I parked the car and we got out and we walked up and rang the doorbell and Ralph came to the door and he welcomed us and met me. And the three of us went and we sat down and, and they exchanged pleasantries and began to reminisce about things that had happened in their life before I was ever even born. And then I remember with this, just the, 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 skill of a trained surgeon, Dr. Bagby stood up, having identified a piece on the wall, walked over, took the piece framed off the wall, walked it back over, set it down on the coffee table, and he said, Ralph, what is this? He says, well, Stedman, you know what that is. That's my marriage license. He said, yes, I thought that's what it was, Ralph. No, Ralph, what vows did you make the day that we signed this document decades ago? And I'm telling you, for the next five or ten minutes, Dr. Bagby just gave Ralph an old-fashioned front-end alignment like I had <laughs> never observed. It was captivating to listen to, to how he was speaking truth in love straight to this man. And the man was sitting there, and he was listening to it. I was so kept. I really was hoping that they had absolutely forgotten that I was still sitting there. And, <clears throat> and, and towards the end of it, I remember Dr. Bagby saying, Ralph, come to your senses. Come back to God. You know you can't live like this and expect for him to pour out his blessings upon you. You're defying him. Turn back. He looked at me and he said, now my assistant Ken is going to pray for you. And I remember my eyes bugging out and, and I thought to myself, that cannot be what I just heard. But I kept looking and both of their heads were bowed and they were looking for me to pray. And sure enough, I'd been tagged it. And so I cleared my throat and I said, uh, dear God, thank you for this chance to come and to talk with Ralph. Please help Ralph to choose the hard right over the easy wrong that he's been choosing. Please bring him back to your heart, God. Help him to repent, to turn around, and to come home to your blessings, to your love, to your grace. Amen. You know, it's been about 30 years. I look back and I don't think I probably would have changed many of the words. 
Matter of fact, I still pray those same sorts of words for many people today who, when I read their prayer requests or hear them even say their prayer requests to me, at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, who are you kidding? You and I both know how you're living right now. Ha! The nerve of you coming saying, I just wish God would do it. But you haven't done what he has already told you to do. You're not being honest. You're not being real. Maybe for you it's not a, an affair like Ralph was having, but maybe for you it's pornography. And you just keep going back to this. And, and you have it rationalized in your mind. Well, you said, this is kind of what men do this day and age. And you're not coming clean and you're not saying, you know what, I've got to repent of this. I've got to get help. i got to step out of the shadow and deal with this and, and come clean because I want to experience God's blessing in my life. I need to work some steps and get liberated from this. Or maybe you're leaning on a substance. Maybe it's for you it's alcohol or maybe something else that's numbing the pain in your life. And you know deep down he's been saying that is what's standing in the way of your growing further in our relationship and experiencing my blessing. There's any number of, of reasons and ways that people do that, just sort of dancing around the will of God that he's already given to us. He's already spoken it very clearly to us, but we keep defying him. Some, some of you, maybe it's a temper problem. You have a real anger. You just explode all over people, and you do it very regularly. And sometimes you just say to yourself, well, that's just the way I am. But maybe that's something you need to repent of. You need to get some help with and do some counseling about and figure out, why do I do that? For some of you, you're just not being honest. You're not being honest at work about something. You're not being honest at home about something. There's duplicity in your life, but you've compartmentalized it out. And then you, you, you dare to come back and say, but now, God, I need you to bless this part of my life over here. Who do you think he is? You think you're playing him? You think he doesn't see? There's a verse in the Psalms, Psalm 66, 18, that says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So repent, turn around, say this is true. I have done this but I'm repenting, I'm turning around, I'm coming back, I'm going to be real and honest and, and bring this into the light and come clean from this. And the moment you do, the, the flow of God's spirit can then start to move, the rivers of his grace begin to flow inside of you again. So why would you hold back from that? For some of you, prayer's not being answered because you're not in his will to start with. You say, well, how do I know what his will is? Well, remember what Dan was talking to us about last week. He was talking about God's word. He was saying the reason that we go to God's word is because he's talking to us. He has something to say. To us. So see, prayer is not just a monologue where we're just saying some things up to God one directionally. If that's all that prayer was, then as Calvin Miller once wrote, prayer would be nothing more than, than speaking to a big ear in the sky. And that's not who God is. God is having a dialogue with us. A tutor. So before we ever pray, he says, I've already said a number of things. Are you, are you listening to me? And after we pray, we're turning to his word yet again. Even this past week, I was talking to a man who said, you know, it's so funny how I wonder, what in the world would God want me to do? And then I'll have my devotions and the verses that I come to. What do you know? There God is just saying it right there. So he makes his will known to us. But are you acting on what you already know of his will? What he's already made clear. That's the first thing. Sometimes we're not right. Sometimes then a second reason that there's a slowness in, in the answer coming. Sometimes our timing is not right. It's not necessarily that we're in sin. It's just that the timing is not right. You've, some of you, you've been here for a while. You've heard me tell the story of how nine years ago, uh, Suzanne and I had uh, decided we were going to uh, buy a new house, and it was under construction. 
and we entered into the contract and we were enjoying the fun that that, uh, that dynamic presents when you get to choose your countertops and your paint and all this stuff. And But there was a problem. The patio home that we were living in, it was not selling. It wasn't even showing. In hindsight, it was 2009 and not much was happening in 2009 for anybody. But we were in it and we weren't kind of aware of what was going, but we were praying, oh God, God, you could, you could just snap your finger and this house would just, just sell like that. And so God, would you do, and we were praying. I mean, we were really praying. And I was talking about, I just was virtually preaching up here in a sandwich board every Sunday to ask me about our patio home. You know, and, and but nothing was happening. And finally, we got to this point of no return where we're gonna have to put down some serious money, not just the money of our upgrades, but like, and I was like, baby, I think maybe God is saying he's not in this one. Maybe we're trying to force something that we thought was, was the right thing at the right time, and it's, it's just not. It's not coming together. And so we went over that day, and we, we canceled, and we took our lumps and lost all the money we'd put into those upgrades and drove home so discouraged and frustrated and embarrassed and not understanding Why? Well, now, nearly, what, nine years later, I look back, and we can see all sorts of reasons why. Because that next year, my next door neighbor, his name's Joe, his wife would die, and I would get to do her funeral and get extra time with him and his family, getting to just share the love of Jesus with them. And then his next-door neighbor, Aubrey, his wife died, and he asked me to do the funeral, and that's when I got to know Aubrey, and Aubrey became a dear friend, and I got to lead him into faith with Jesus. And we had ended up having a wonderful discipling relationship for a number of years as he grew further in his faith, and he had never known anything about Jesus and church, and God, and Bible, and all those sorts of things. And those things couldn't have happened if we'd have moved off on our time schedule. And Suzanne and I could list any number of other things. In fact, one that, that stands out had to do with our children and our boys' uh, specific detailed protection that God was providing by our being where we were and not where we uh, might have been. And then, when you know, a um, couple of years ago, Suzanne got the bug again said, I think it maybe it's time for us. The boys are getting big. They bang into this little patio house walls all the time. I think it's time. I said, oh, Lord, here we go. Let's, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. Uh, and so she found this home just right around the corner from us. And wouldn't you know, before we could even get the house listed, a wonderful couple in this church got wind that we were going to be selling our house, and they called us and said, could we come and see your house? And they came over and said, yes, you can come see. They came over and they saw it before it's even listed, and they said, we'd like to buy it. I said, where's the easy button? This is, the, oh my gosh, we didn't, just effortless. And that's how it is. When you get your request synced up with God's timetable, it just comes together. And so my message to some of us in prayer is this. If you feel like you're just straining and pushing and laboring to get this boulder up the mountain, maybe it's because you are trying to push this boulder up a mountain and he's not in it. And it doesn't matter how hard you push, it's not going to go. Oh, maybe you've got an inch, but that's not worth it. Just let it go, surrender, and just say, okay, God, clearly you're not in this one. I'm just good. We're going to yield ourselves to you and to your timing instead of trying to force it and press it and push it, which we're so inclined to do. We, especially in this nation, we like things fast. We like our fast food. We like everything. We want our prayers fast. And sometimes he's like, that's not the way it's going to be. Sometimes it's going to feel like you're asking and seeking and knocking. But you just haven't any idea what sorts of things he's doing behind the scenes while we're waiting. Parts and people that he's moving around that, that only in hindsight maybe we get to look back and say, I see a little bit of at least what was going on and why it had to be a not yet in that season. So sometimes we're, we're not right. Sometimes the timing's not right and then there's a the third one. Sometimes the request just didn't right. It's just not the right request. 
Look at what uh, Jesus said in verse 11 of our passage. Which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish, would give him a snake instead? Or if he asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? What's Jesus explaining here? Well, you see, over the Middle East, they have this kind of scorpion called the white scorpion. And it would just curl up, it could just curl up and look like an egg. And so a child comes along and says, Daddy, I want the egg. And the dad says, nope, you're not going to have that egg because that ain't an egg. That's a scorpion. Same thing about, I want the fish. No, honey, that's not a fish. That's a snake. What loving father would let his child have either of those? Sort? No, you, the answer is no. And, and sometimes we who are loving parents, we have to do that as well, right? You can understand that if you are a parent or if you ever had a parent. You know that, that sometimes the answer has to be no. Why? Because you love your kid. Just the way that sometimes when I picked up one of my boys from a birthday party where they just loaded them down with unlimited sodas and pizza and birthday cake and sent them out with a lollipop in their mouth and, and, and we get a few miles down the road nearly home and we pass the McDonald's. Dad, could we stop in there and, and get a McFlurry? No! The answer is no. Why, Dad? Because I love you and I care about your liver and I care about your, your heart. And we got heart issues in our family now, thanks to me. And he has, you, no, you can't have that. All right? And so sometimes God has to say no to us if it's just not the right request. Not now, not ever. It's just that this one isn't going to be the right request. But you know what's, I think, particularly heartening? when sometimes that answer is no, is to remember Jesus himself wants God to know. Hebrews 4 tells us that we have a high priest in Jesus who went through, who's gone through, who can sympathize with everything you go through because he's faced every trial, including getting a no. You say, when did he get a no? Don't you remember the night that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was just praying so hard is sweat and blood. He, he was saying, oh, Father, is there any way that we could get this mission accomplished for which I have come without me having to go to the cross tomorrow? Is there any way we could get this done? Three times it says he asked him, and three times the Father said, no, no, no. And so faithfully, Jesus went to that cross after living the life of sinless perfection we couldn't live and he died the death on the cross for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins as our substitute, as our stand-in so that we don't have to take the hit for our sins. And then on the third day, he conquered the grave. He came back to life and signifies to all of us, if you will link yourself to me by faith, you too will have life, abundant now and everlasting hereafter. So trust in me. So really when you think about it in a roundabout sort of way, the greatest good news, the gospel, that we get the story of our salvation came about because Jesus got a no. And in that case, we're grateful that he got a no. Roundaboutly, the only reason that we can have so many yeses from God is because Jesus got that no. No. But I know when you get a no, sometimes it's easy to get jaded and cynical and the devil tries to sneak in and say, see, you can't trust God. He, you need to take life into your own hands. Take matters into your own hands. You've got to be your own boss. You've got to be your own king. You've got to take... Don't do it. Why? Because Jesus said, hey, 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 that's when you're liable to forget who we're dealing with. Remember, we're not dealing with a crotchety neighbor. Who we're dealing with? We're dealing with a father. Look at the last verse, verse 13. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, Jesus says, then how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Matthew, in chapter 7, verse 11, gives us the same thing, slightly different. He says, if you, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Either way, it doesn't matter. What Jesus was saying is we have a good, good father who gives his best gifts to us. Yes, even the gift of the Holy Spirit to live right inside of us. Why? Because he's a good, good father. And you can understand that because many of you are fathers. And Jesus said, and all of you are evil. All of us are evil. He says, but still, you know how to give good gifts to your children. I'm not saying that you always do, but you know how. How much more then, contrast, does our Father in heaven know how to give good gifts, even the gift of his Holy Spirit, to those who ask him, those of us who are called his children? 
Well, I'll close with this. On past Monday night, I, I had a midnight visitor of my own. Uh, my 10-year-old, he came in right in the middle of the night and whispering loudly enough that I would hear and be awakened, he said, Dad, Dad, I just vomited. <laughs> and I woke up, and at that point, I said what every loving, God-honoring father says. I said, go tell your mom. <laughs> now, I didn't really do that. We decided to let her sleep, and I got up, and we headed upstairs to deal with the mess and to get things patched up. And we got them all patched up. And, and now you have to understand, if you don't know me up close, uh, I'm kind of a neat nix. I'm not the kind of guy who goes around looking for messes like that. I mean, I always kind of keep my Purell uh, really close, you know. And, and, but I didn't hesitate in that situation. And I got reflecting about that after, after it was all over. And I thought, why did you not even hesitate? I know I didn't hesitate. Because that boy, <laughs> that boy, I just love that boy. I love both my boys. And that's what love does when we have a child that we just love. John wrote, what manner of love is this? that the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called his children, the very children of God. So later as I was reflecting on that whole <laughs> scene from Monday night, I just sensed the whisper of the Father saying to me, in the same way that you love your boys. That's just a a glimpse, a glimmer, just a, a sliver of how much I love you. He loves me. He doesn't just love me. He loves you, too, which is what I really felt like he wanted me to make sure that you understood before you leave here. Because I know, I know, it can be hard, especially when the prayer is taking long and we're having to persevere and continue asking and seeking and knocking. Don't lose sight of the fact, though, of who it is that we're talking to. We're talking to a good, good father. That's why I like what Tim Keller said. Sometimes if the answer is no, let's just remember, God is going to give you what you would have asked for in the first place, if you knew everything that he knew. That's how good he is. So let's turn to him. If you haven't stepped into the, the re-sync rhythm of just saying, you know what, I'm going to pull aside and have some time with the Lord every day, reading some of his word, doing what, John, uh, what Dan was saying last week, and just reading a chapter a day of John and letting him speak to us. And then I'm, I'm adding in the prayer portion and saying, why didn't you then just, let's begin to talk with him. And, and let's work on this relationship. Why? Because he's a good, good father. And he wants to bring you more closely into his heart. And that's why we decided we would close the service today by coming to the Lord's table. Because it gives us a chance to all have a few minutes just for prayer. Remembering that night that he was betrayed, he took the bread with his disciples and he, and he gave it new meaning. And he said, now this is my body and it's broken for you. It's what's going to happen to me in a few hours, he was thinking. I want you to take it and I want you to eat it. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. I want you to drink of this. When you come together, you will remember me. And so we're going to come in just a moment. The ushers are going to lead you in both of our rooms, and you'll come and you'll take one of the, come to one of the stations up front, and you take one of the gluten-free uh, crackers, and you can dip it into the grape juice, and then you can partake. And even as you do, you just let him speak to you. You meet with him. Maybe you need to come clean with him. You need to do some business with him that you've been hiding from. Why don't you, let's just do that. Let's not go charging out of here in a perfunctory sort of way, but let's let this be real 
um, meaningful time that we actually commune with him. The musicians in both our rooms will be leading us and we can be singing. And I'll invite you to, to stay a moment and, and pray on the steps. Sometimes it's just moving our body to a little different rhythm, just as opposed to going and sitting back down at the seats. But Matt, why don't you pull off and pray for Maybe you say, it helped me to have someone to pray with. We'll have some prayer partners. I've asked some friends if they would come and just be available. And I'm thinking of how in Matthew it says, where two are or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them in a special way. Sometimes in our persisting prayer, we need to have a partner that we're praying it with. Why don't you pray? Um, and let's just ask God to work in these final moments. After we've all communed and after we've sung a few songs, then we'll dismiss together. Let me pray. Lord, won't you meet with us now? Thanks for leaving these tangible signs of bread, grape juice, that in a moment like this take on an altogether different meaning for us. It's transformational. Won't you meet with us by the power of your Holy Spirit? And touch us at our point of need. Some of us, we have never said yes to you in the first place. We've never said yes to your forgiveness that you offer. Today, even in these moments, I pray as that person comes to the table that they would say, yes, I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my heart today. This, this is my day. I'm crossing the line. Others of us, we've done that maybe years ago. But we want to commune with you anew as well. Won't you meet with us? in these minutes now. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at FaithBridge, and I'm sitting with Pastor Ken, who just preached a message on prayer mm -hmm. in our Resync series called Eliminating the Static. That's right. Uh, and it was good. It was real, real good stuff. Good. Um, well, we have a couple questions in. One, uh, the first one, just very uh, relatable, just what do we do when we're just not feeling it? When it's just something we're not feeling. Uh, yeah, I don't want to pray because I'm just not feeling yeah. like praying. Yeah. yeah. You know, I th a couple of things to say about that. The the first one that comes to mind is, <laughs> it comes from my trainer at the gym. Mm. Um, and um, it probably says something about me that I pay somebody to make me lift weights <laughs> because I won't do it <laughs> if I don't pay some. Now I'll do the cardio. That's not a problem. But I just won't lift the weights unless mm -hmm. somebody's telling me, here's what we're going to do next. And here's how you do it right. And, um, and you know, he is a really fit guy. And we've got talking about, um, you know, what's it take to get in the shape that you're in? Mm -hmm. In a word, it's persistence. Right. It's just showing up day after day and not giving in to uh, the, you know, I just don't feel like it today. So he has this little thing that we'll talk about diet. And, mm -hmm. and he said, remember, you're in charge of your body. Your body's not in charge of you. Right. You're in charge of your body. Well, I think that there's probably a good spiritual application there as well. Um, a lot of spiritual growth is no different than, than physical mm -hmm. uh, fitness. It's just showing up. And sometimes we're not going to feel it. And I think the temptation is, um, especially in an era in which we're living, where um, the gospel is particularly uh, coming alive in so many people, and you hear about gospel-centered preaching and gospel-centered churches, and uh, which we are all of, the temptation could be mm -hmm. is just to say, you know what, I'm a gospel person, it's all about grace, and so I'm not feeling it, so I'm just not going to show up. I think the temptation, what I'm saying is, um, if we're not careful, we can say, if it requires discipline, it's probably, if my heart's not in it, it's not even worth doing. Well, no. Um, I don't think that's the case. If 
you are a gospel-centered person, then all the more reason, let's just show up out of faithfulness because he was faithful to us in our unfaithfulness. So let's, let's just show up. And there's something about doing it that, I think of John Wesley, who, uh, one of my heroes, when w one of his preachers was asking him a similar sort of question, mm -hmm. um, particularly about preaching. And how do you, you know, when you're just feeling flat, he said, you just get out there and you preach grace again. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that sometimes even as you preach it, the Lord begins to stir your spirit. Right. But it wouldn't have happened if you hadn't shown up. Right. And so I think that maybe that's a good word for us on this one. That's so good. Just show up. That's I think simple. that's, that's simple. Yeah, we, we think it must be something much more complicated. But sometimes it, just saying, you know what? Every day at this time, I go to my prayer chair or my prayer closet mm -hmm. and I have my time with the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's just what I do. That's so good. Well, you don't ask yourself, am I going to brush my teeth today? Mm -hmm. You just, of course you're going to do that. Yeah, or take a shower, of course you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're really in good shape, of course you're going to do that. Um, well, maybe we need to consider we're not going to make progress if we don't do that spiritually. Right. right. Definitely makes sense. Well, our second question, um, I'll read it. It says, if being right with God is a condition to having uh, prayer answered, whose prayers can be answered? Only Jesus was right with God, and the answer to his prayer was no. Yeah, that's a very good question. Kind of two questions in one. Mm -hmm. Well, let's back up and, and let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. No one is right with God. Well, that is true. Mm -hmm. If we have not yet experienced grace and appropriated his salvation mm -hmm. into our lives, then um, that is absolutely true. Now, what we know, though, is that he infuses into us his righteousness at our salvation. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, it's incumbent upon us to say, now that I know uh, the truth, now that I know your grace, now that I know your word, my responsibility is to bring my life into conformity with right. that. And this is why in 1 John 5, 14, for example, um, he, John makes very clear, um, prayer is contingent upon you being and your request being in the will of mm -hmm. God. Right. And so I, um, let's be sure that we understand clearly, um, yes, technically none of us are good, without a savior, mm -hmm. after we are saved, we have come into his uh, grace and he does want to hear us pray. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what do you do with all of the prayer, uh, all of the teachings, including Jesus, including Paul, who was saying, who were saying, pray continually, mm -hmm. pray always. Um, when you pray, here's how you pray. Mm -hmm. What were they just toying with us? <laughs> well, you know, that can't be the case. So, the, um, that's a technically interesting question, but um, let's take him at his word when he says, uh, no, you, you, now let's come into his will because we have surrendered to his grace. Now, Jesus did indeed get that no, um, and in that regard, he shared in our humanity mm -hmm. um, and even went through the pain, great pain, of getting a no mm -hmm. when he knew what was going to have to uh, follow. I don't think though in any way uh, it follows, well, we just want, why bother praying? Because even Jesus got a no. Well, the, yeah, in that one instance, because of the whole mission uh, for which he had come to earth, mm -hmm. um, for which he was wrestling over, uh, I don't think again, because of all the other things that Jesus said about prayer and the, the desire that the Father has to be in relationship with us. So let's press on and keep praying, um, notwithstanding uh, the no that he experienced in that situation. Right. That's so good. Well, we have a third and final question. Um, it says, we know that God has a plan, but when we pray, can he change his plans and give it to us? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> That's a very great question. Well, there's maybe a couple of answers. The first, the first thing that comes to my mind is, I think of Moses. Mm -hmm. And you remember how um, when he was leading the Israelites 
out of Egypt and into the promised land. And he goes up uh, to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments and the people uh, rebel and they make the golden calf. And, and God is so upset and he's going to just wipe them out. And what did Moses do? It says he went before the Lord and he was like, God, don't do it. Don't do it. If you do it, the Egyptians will be like, ha, 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 look at that God they said that they followed. And he took them out in the um, desert and killed them all. So much for that God. Don't do it, God. Don't. And uh, then, of course, it says that he didn't. Mm -hmm. And it, Moses even put himself on the line and said, just wipe me out if you got to take somebody for, for the and was offering him, and God didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, to read that, you're like, wow. Um, th that certainly seems like there, there was some transaction that mm -hmm. was happening there. Um, perhaps another one. Um, when Abraham uh, was praying for Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember he starts that negotiating thing. And he says, if there be, what was it, 50, 40? Uh, what did he start with? I think 40. Um, righteous people, then would you not wipe it? And God says, yeah, I won't wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah if you can find 40 righteous people. And then he said, well, 30. <laughs> yes, I won't do it if you find 30. Well, we're talking, God. How about 20? And he works it down to... Uh, you know, just a few. And um, so you look at that exchange and was, it, you would be inclined to say, it would certainly seem that, th that there really is something that is going on here mm -hmm. in the spiritual realm. And of course, in the end, he doesn't wipe out Lot. Mm -hmm. And it says, because of the prayers of Abraham, um, he did it for that. Now, that still doesn't entirely answer our question. Well, was he really not ever going to do that, but he just said he was to get Aaron praying, and the, but he really just, then he didn't, but he never really was in the first. Mm -hmm. This is one of the great questions that we will never know right. until we get to the other side. Um, and so I think this is where we have to, as followers of Jesus, just go after God with the um, confidence that he is in control and that he's working his mm -hmm. uh, plans together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And, but we pray earnestly uh, with every indication that is possible that this is, this matters. Right. I'll close with one last illustration. I remember hearing the most interesting story um, uh, from a p preacher in Dallas called Matt Chandler. And Matt and I got to know a little bit each, uh, each other a little bit when we were in a group together back about a decade ago. And he was uh, diagnosed with cancer, brain cancer, very serious brain cancer. And I really wanted to hear what's he going to say. Now, you have to understand, he's a thoroughgoing uh, Calvinist, Reformed, God is um, in control and um, really don't have time probably to get into old Calvinism and Arminianism sort of thing here. But I was intrigued. He said, I want us to pray for me, for the sake of my wife, for the sake of my children. I uh, don't remember exactly how he said, but he said, like mm -hmm. it matters. And we don't know exactly how this works to, together, but I'm a, he says, pray. So would you pray with me and pray? And they, I mean, they prayed for him. He's doing fine to my mm -hmm. awareness, even today, a decade later. Mm -hmm. And I sent him a note. And I said, I, I really like how you brought your theology together with the mandates of scripture to go after God. Just go after mm -hmm. it. Who really knows? We're going to pray, 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 pray. Please, God, please spare uh, this child of yours. Mm, that's so good. Yeah. I think that's probably the best we can do this side of heaven. Just go for it. Yep. <laughs> I love it. That's right. Well, um, I know that sermon was encouraging good. and helpful uh, to many, and so were these questions. So 
Thank you, Pastor Ken. Uh, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.